Good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm Jocelyn Cesari. I'm a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center. And um, we are meeting online because of the circumstances. Um, this is the continuation of a launch series discussion. We started early March and we, as you know, had to move online uh, in order to keep going with the discussion on the interaction between national communities and religious communities. The, uh, India and Hinduism. And um, I am very happy and honored to engage the discussion on orthodoxy and uh, Russia with my colleague, uh, Christina Stockel, who is joining us from Austria. And that will be my uh, interlocutor uh, in this discussion. Um, so uh, if you want to say a few words, uh, hello, and then we, we move on. Um, Christina, maybe say hello, <laughs> and where you are, where you are right now, because uh, not everybody is in the U.S., right? No, no, you're right, you're right. So um, thank you, Jocelyn, for inviting me to join um, this discussion. Um, I'm very excited uh, that you thought about me all the way um, in Europe. Um, I'm in Austria right now. Um, for those who don't know me, I teach sociology at the University of Innsbruck. And I've done research on, on the Russian Orthodox Church for many years. And um, I've also been visiting the Berkeley Center every now and then, but it's the first time that I meet you virtually. And I think that's a very good occasion. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first uh, angle of discussion I would like to start with you is um, through this question. Is, really, is there really a, a Russian nationalism? Why I'm saying that is because through the research I have done for this project, uh, it appears very clearly that the scholarship is divided on that. Um, lots of scholars argue that Russia went from one empire to another, the Tsarist one to the Soviet one, and that there was really not a, a, a sense of building a nation based on some common culture, but also common principles around equality or sovereignty, and that it's only very recently uh, since the reduction to the Federation, and we can even argue that the Federation may not meet all the criteria of a nation. So if, you, if we look at the history of nation building in, uh, in, in Russia, we see clearly that uh, indeed, there is a specificity that struck me a lot doing comparison with other cases that uh, the Russian state was at the same time a colonizing force be because the empire included a lot of ethnies and, and groups that were not Russian. And at the same time, it was a colonized country because all the, these parts of territory were part of the same, I would say, overarching power. So this is quite interesting because, as you know, I have worked a lot on decolonized or post-colonized country. And so to, to face a country that was both is quite interesting. And people would argue that you see the, the Russians are trying or hesitating between two kinds of politics. One was Russification, one was on the other hand trying to maintain the recognition and life of a lot of ethnies and languages and religion. And you can also argue that the Bolshevik state tried both. And in, under the Bolshevik rule, there was this principle of recognizing not nations, but nationalities, which were which was a word to uh, refer to different ethnies and also religion. So what is the situation now? And what is your position through your scholarship about Russian and nationality or nationalism in this case? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, if, if, we, if we want to define um, a nation as a group of people that identifies with an idea that makes it a nation, then I think in the Russian case, we should distinguish different types of nation or nationalisms. Um, I think there is a historical 
na nationalism, a historical idea of nation, which is very much connected with the territory of, of the Tsarist Empire. Um, which includes um, territories that are today independent nation states, um, um, especially Belarus and Ukraine, um, but also Moldova, for example, um, also parts of Georgia. Um, so there is this historical idea of, of Russians, other people that are sort of inhabit that historical area as opposed to Ottomans, as opposed to the Polish Commonwealth as opposed to the Austrian Empire. Um, then there's another idea of nation, um, which is more connected with, with really an idea of, of what is Russia's destiny. So it's this Russian messianism. So Russia has a special, um, um, a special um, task to fulfill in the world. I and mean, th this idea was formulated by Dostoevsky. It became very powerful in the end of the, of the 19th century and, and throughout all this period in philosophy, which we call the Silver Age. Um, Berdyaev wrote a book, it's called The Russian Idea. So um, here the Russian idea around which people can group, um, feel as a group is, is not about territory, it's not about ethnic, ethnic belonging, it's about uh, an, an idea of a shared future. And then finally, there is the idea of ethnic belonging. So there are, that there are ethnic Russians, um, which are people who speak Russian as their first language, as opposed to citizens of the Soviet Union who, who had other first languages. Um, and, and in the Soviet Union, you were right. I mean, nationality was something that people had to write in their passports. Um, and, and there were nationalities uh, that, that we actually would rather consider religions like here. Um, Jewish people had, would, would, would sign their nationality as Jewish. Um, so um, there is this idea of nation, um, of, nas of nationality, of belonging to a certain group, but the state itself, um, especially also the, the Tsarist state was a multinational empire and the Soviet Union was a multinational um, um, union. It was also multilingu multilinguistic union. And, and there was actually a lot of emphasis put on, on keeping autochthonous traditions. Now, because you asked the question about religion, I think what, what is um, special about Russian, uh, the connection between Russian nationalism and religion, is that the Russian Orthodox tradition can tap into all these different definitions of nationalism. Um, it, it, it's kind of a source of, of the messianic idea. It can go along with the messianic idea. Um, it can also go along and become a source for this territorial idea of saying this is where believers who belong to the Russian Orthodox Church, who we consider our canonical territory. Um, so it can go along with that idea. Um, and I think the, the idea that for the church probably is the least natural is the ethnic one. Um, um, because, um, yes, I think that's the least. And then one thing which you haven't no, mentioned yet, but of course there, there is this word Russian, Ruski, mm -hmm. um, and the new federation is, is, uh, um, is usually referred to as Rasiski, so as a civic identity of belonging to the Russian federation. Um, so the, the, the Russian language manages to make a difference between sort of Russian as ethnic belonging or sort of more communal belonging and and um, civic belonging, which would be Rasiski. Yes. Um, before um, we keep on, I would like to say to our audience that there is a Q&A open and uh, I will um, pick up the questions and try to respond from one block of, you know, topic we are trying to address. So for the people who have joined us now, we are discussing the reality of Russian nationalism, knowing the history of Russia that went from the Tsar to the Soviet Empire and, and the, indeed the continuous discussion in Russian history about the ethnic and religious diversity and the use of the concept of nationality within the empire that were not, it's different from the nation. So before um, we keep exchanging on that, um, it seems to me that, that there has always been a sort of um, continuous tension between the, the political institution, let's 
let's start with the Tsar and the religious institution, which is the patriarch. So the patriarchate of the, of the uh, Russian orthodoxy. So how, from what I understand, is indeed there is this foundational moment that is probably a myth about what's called Holy Ruth. And again, this is something very different from what we have experienced in the West, meaning that both the Tsar and the Patriarch share some kind of religious legitimacy, but it's at the same time differentiated in a way that allows this holy rules. It's about the territory of Russia, it's about the orthodoxy, and as you mentioned it, also a special um, mission of fate in history. So from this foundational moment, what we see emerging is clearly the tension and the attempt by both, I would not say it's only the Tsar, but also the Patriarch at some moment, trying to take over <laughs> the leadership on both domains, if I wish the, the mundane and the, uh, and the transcendent. And, and what will happen quickly, if, if I skip a lot of centuries and go to Peter the Great, is clearly on the influence of the West, the attempt by Peter the Great, then strengthened by Catherine the Great, to confessionalize orthodoxy, to make it like it was existing in Europe, the state controls the religion and the religious institution. And we can say that by the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, um, the state has won. They have subdued um, the the institution of the patriarchate. And unlike what was very surprising for me to look at this uh, history is unlike what people think, the, the, the patriarchate was not very happy with the Tsar. So they were not, even at the time of the revolution, the Bolshevik revolution, they were not completely allied with the Tsarist institution, which may also explain how they moved into the communist period. Um, but so you see right there this continuous tension at this institutional level with unresolved indeed parameter of defining who are we as a community under the, the rule of the Tsar and, uh, and not all people in these territories are Orthodox or Russian. So, and this is, I think the, the, the ambiguity that was, uh, channeled into the building of the Soviet um, era. Uh, so we have a lot of questions, um, uh, Christina, before I, I, op I ask you to react to that. Um, uh, Christina, can you see this with me as well? Yes, I can or, see the questions, yes. Uh, uh, oh, so you see, there is this question on the whole believers, which is an important one, and imperial nationalists. So you may probably want to include this in, in your feedback to, to, to what I said. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, you said that it, it is, I completely agree with how you reconstruct the history <laughs> of, of church-state relations in, in the Russian Empire. Um, and I think it's correct to say that um, a process of state dominion over the church starts with Peter the Great and then is continued by Catherine and in a way is completed by the Bolsheviks. But um, it's important to realize that there is this window in 1917, um, just after the revolution, where um, it's not so obvious what the, what, what the Bolsheviks will do with the church. And, and this is the period when, when the Moscow Patriarchate or the church is allowed to re-elect the Patriarch, which um, was not the case uh, before. So in that sense, they, they, they owe something to, 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 to that window of opportunity. A, a very, this very important council takes place. Um, I mean, it then fails, but for one year, there's a lot of activity. So in that sense, um, um, you are right. So the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, um, but really, it it doesn't look back on a history of independence no. or of um, it. It looks back to history of state domination, and not even Peter the Great already already um, um, under yeah from the very beginning in a way. Um, so. 
But the church, non in in all these years, it never went into a into a relationship of antagonism with the state. Rather, it relied on the state um, still to fulfill its goals. And and this may be here where the old believers come in, because um, the Russian Orthodox Church faced with um, with potential schisms. Um, so there was the debate between the possessors and the non-possessors, and then the debate with the old believers. Um, the, uh, it always relied on the power of the state to suppress um, the schismatics. In the case of the old believers, they were, they were sort of pushed to the margins of the empire um, um, and, and, and set that, set, they became kind of colonizers also for large territories of Russia. Um, so um, the Russian Orthodox Church um, received a lot from the, from the Russian imperial state um, in terms of support and was ready to, to, to barter support in turn against against internal critics um, and i think in that sense uh, the the um, the imperial nationalism was clearly um one where the relationship of religions in the empire was hierarchical and and so the tsar because he was orthodox um orthodoxy would still be the would be the most important religion but then all the others would get recognition as well so it's, muslims would get their recognition and and, and yes um, other religions, Protestants, Catholics, Jews, um, Buddhists, which in a way is what we see now again. I mean, the post-Soviet Russia has, has yeah. re indicated that model. Yeah, so that's what, uh, for example, um, there were some ambiguities about other religious groups. And it, it is, it seems to me that Catherine the Great was the one who deliberately recognized as a religion. It was very interesting to read how, for example, she recognized uh, a representative body of Muslim and allowed Sharia law to uh, regulate marriages and, and, and the life of a lot of Muslim population across the empire. And, and so th this was quite interesting when we know that this was not even thinkable in Western Europe <laughs> at the time. So there was a lot of interesting elements here. The, the Jews seemed to me were always seen as foreigners because of the tension with Poland, while the Muslim was seen as part of the, you know, of what was the Russian empire. The, there was this dispute, and she said, Catherine the Great said clearly, Jews are not part of the Russian Empire, if I am not mistaken. And, and, and so there was different treatment of different religious groups, according again to their history, with I think the building of the of the czar as a, of the of the czarist institution, which again shows to me a sort of disconnect between the political institution and their evolution, and what is a political community made of different groups with the ethnic or religious. And this disconnect is really interesting to me because again, if we come from a European experience, we tend to to associate both, you know, to look at nation and state as a sort of um, unified entity, while, while it is not the case. Uh, and for me, Russia is, is a very significant example of, of two disconnected evolution, actually, or, or, or not going in the same, with the same synchronic pace, so to speak. Um, I have a lot of questions I would like to run by you uh, uh, that, that are touching on this uh, topic exactly. Um, I, I will, oh, hold on, there was, a, there was a question interestingly on, uh, on comparing with Southeast Asia. I, know, I don't know if you see that uh, about describing the problem of majorities acting like minorities. Um, but I, I, are you, uh, do you think, Christina, that it's a way to look at Russian orthodoxy in Russia, for example? Well, I think, Well, yeah, I, I think it's a very good question. And, and um, the Russian Orthodox Church today, um, it, it indeed sometimes acts as if it's a minority in need of protection. And then in other situations, it's act, it acts as if it's a majority. Um, and I think it plays both cards depending on the situation. Um, the minority card is easy to play because the country comes out of 70 years of communism where religion was suppressed and um, the church can always sort of move back and say, you know, so we, we, we have been the victim of the state, we can potentially again be the victim. Um, 
And if we think about the situation of the mid 90s, when the, when the church was really worried about, um, about missionaries coming from, from the West to Russia, so sort of proselytizing in Russia, I mean, um, there was a kind of hysteria about that. And the church clearly played this card of we need protection from the state. Um, there's one thing I want to add, which we didn't say before. I think the Russian religious pluralism, if you can say, if you can say that, so the fact that there are different re re very large religious groups inside uh, this Russian state, what's special about it is that they are actually quite territorially divided. So Muslims are in the Kazan area, in, in, in the south, towards the Caucasus, and then Buddhists are, are sort of in the Siberian parts, um, and, and there's this sort of central Russia. So it, this, this idea that the, then you have the big cities, which are obviously multi-religious, but um, generally the idea is very much that you can, you can put your hand on where these religious groups are, and these are communities that, that are kind of lo lo located. Yeah, so I want to move on because some of the questions are also touching on that. On the second uh, block of question related to secularism in Russia, right? So after the Tsarist period and the Bolshevik period, which interestingly, there is no clear separation between the Orthodox Church and the state under the, the Bolshevik era, although it was indeed, as we know, persecuted heavily, uh, although there was up and down in the persecution. I mean, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, important to say that the, there was a huge loss of not only material uh, buildings, wealth, but also people. Uh, so that this is something to, to keep in mind. And then 1997 come with a new constitutional law. And for the first time, um, there is acknowledgement of secularism in uh, Russia with a thing that, again, if we are American or European, also European would understand that. It also includes some cooperation between the state and all the religions, and you already touched on that. And you can see that there is a tension between cooperation and control, both being used. And the, the rise of the Orthodox Patriarch as a sort of primus inter pares, trying to have a, a privileged role, building on the history we just touched on, to enter in a, in a privileged communication with the state and also be the spoke institution or person for the other religion, which I found also very uh, uh, interesting. So could you describe a little more in detail what's the situation now of the state and religions in, in uh, Russia. And um, I will gather a few more questions around that yeah. to, to, to bounce out to you, okay? No, you, you are completely right in saying that um, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Patriarch of Moscow now feels as if he's kind of the, the, the main interlocutor on, on religious issues. Um, he's also a gatekeeper when it comes to, um, for example, um, recognizing new religious groups um, um, and this whole idea that uh, there are e traditional religions inside Russia exist is, is an idea um, that was that was invented in a way by by the church by the Russian Orthodox Church so we have traditional religions Muslims belong to that Buddhists belong to that and and with these we have privileged relations but then there are others those that are newcomers especially Protestant groups from from the US or from the West and and they are not part of that panorama so this was the background to the 1997 law which you which you spoke about um, and one is to say that the Russian Orthodox Church or religion in the Soviet Union was really controlled. So in, in 1942, Stalin created this, uh, this body, um, this office for religious affairs, and that it was a KGB office that controlled religious activities, especially for foreign policy purposes, not only those of the Russian Orthodox Church, also those of the Muslim community. Um, and and the, I think that that was this relationship of control did indeed stop in the early 90s because that body no longer existed. Um, but a similar institution has been recreated recently. So this, this coordinating body between Russian, the Russian state and the Russian traditional religions. 
it's more symbolic, it's ceremonial, but there is again a visible state coordination, um, which I think in the in the 90s there was a period where this um, was not so visible, and I also think that it's important now to to realize that um, the patriarchate changed. So it was patriarchal Lexi until uh, 2008, and then since 2009 we have patriarch Kirill, and um, patriarchal Lexi appears now with hindsight to have been more interested in a, a detached relationship from the state, um, whereas Kirill has really um, fought, uh, forged much closer ties with the Kremlin. Yes. Um, so there was a few questions about, um, you, you know, indeed going back to the state uh, orthodoxy relation today, um, is there some kind of, um, I, I would say, um, you, you know, there, there are two types of discussion. Some would say that the state uses the uh, patriarchate for its own political goals. But I see also the opposite, how the, the Orthodox Church tried to push sometimes legislation in the favor, some kind of, I would say, uh, conservative citizenship, you know, there is a whole debate here. So when the state sees benefit to it, especially toward greater control, they, there, there are some kind of leniency toward the acknowledge, for example, the blasphemy laws, which is very interesting to see how this is played out in, uh, in, in, in the Russian space. But when it comes to abortion, or contraception that are the legacy of the Soviet period, like the people, first, not only the political leader, but I would say even the lay Russians, they don't want to change this at all. Yes. So there is an yes. interesting question about the religiosity of Russia today. I mean, we say that the churches are full, but people do not really behave according to all the prescription of the uh, Orthodox uh, Church. And so there is this gap here with, between which the state and the uh, Orthodoxy as an institution are playing, if you would, could add a few things to, to that. Yes. And there was a question on what is the noticeable difference in religiosity among age group, which is mm -hmm. also a question related to this. Uh, no, you're definitely right that the church, um, that, so sometimes it, sometimes the church can use the state and in other moments the state will use ideas that have been developed inside, inside the church. Um, and it can get away with that, I think, precisely because what you point out is that there's a lot of insecurity really about the degree of religiosity in Russian society what, and what, what Russians expect from the church, church and what they expect from the state in terms of how their state relates to the church. So um, the, the opinion polls we, we have, um, they show that now maybe between 55 and 60 percent of Russians will say that they are orthodox. But then um, the Pew Research has done this, this research. If you then dig deeper and ask, do you believe in God or um, do you believe in life after death? You know, fewer people will, will say that they believe in, in essential points of, of, of Christian faith. So um, this, this declaration of being orthodox also has something to do with the idea we cast before, sort of a kind of national belonging to, 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 to this group that identifies as Russian and Orthodox. Um, and uh, so Russia, I think we have to realize Russia is a deeply, deeply secularized society. Um, it is not a society that carries on um, an, a living memory of, of religious ritual and history. I mean, the, the, the most vivid living memory is that of a grandmother that um, sort of secretly would still go to church and maybe have a child baptized, but, but no one in the family was allowed to talk about it. And, and um, Geraldine Fagan has written a very interesting book about that, um, um, reporting for, for Forum 18 on religious freedom issues in Russia, saying that at Easter, for example, um, so the Easter tradition is to go and attend Easter Mass. Um, it is not an Easter tradition to go and visit the cemeteries. Um, this happens in the Orthodox liturgy um, eight days after Easter. But this, in, the, in the Soviet period, in order to prevent people from going to church, this, this ritual of going to the cemeteries was invented. 
And today, still many more people go to cemeteries, which is a kind of religious feeling ritual. It's not the religious, it's not the orthodox religious ritual. So more people go to cemeteries than may actually attend church. Then you also said, you know, the churches are full. And I think the churches are full um, for, for special festivities like Easter, Christmas, or when you have special moments of veneration. But they're not, they not full on an everyday level. No. Um, and in that sense, Russia is not that different from a standard European country. It's very different from the US, but it's, it, in that sense, Russia today, by numbers, is very European of yes. church attendance. But there is still this clear uh, attachment, as you mentioned, between being Russian and being Orthodox, right? And I think that this allows, indeed, this uh, privileged role of communication between the, the, the Orthodox patriarch and, and the state. And I think the, the relationship between the Putin and the patriarch are, are quite uh, significant uh, of that, um, you know, feeling or, or identification to a special status. Um, before we move on to the foreign policy, because there are lots of questions on that, and, and that's something also we wanted to touch on. There was a question that I found uh, uh, right on, on what we are discussing now. Um, someone asked, do you expect relations between the rock leadership, the Russian Orthodox Church leadership and its priests to change as a result of the open letters signed by Orthodox priests last September, criticizing the crackdown on protests in Moscow? So what, what do you think about that, Christina? I mean, that letter was a really interesting moment in recent Orthodox history because um, nothing of the sort had come out of this group of Orthodox priests for, for, for many, many years. Um, and it's not that there, had, there wouldn't have been occasions. I mean, there was a debate inside the Russian Orthodox Church over the treatment of, of the members of the Pussy Riot um, punk group, you know, whether those should, those, they should go to prison or not. Um, there was a large, large debate about, about the annexation of Crimea, the war in Ukraine. Um, and, and there were also clearly people inside the Russian Orthodox Church priests who were very unhappy um, with the patriarch not taking a stronger line on, on, on this war uh, going on in Eastern Ukraine. I mean, there were both there want, those who wanted him more hard line and those who wanted him more, more um, soft line in a way or, or more, more opposing to the, to the patriarch, to the state. But still, you know, so um, it was always clear that in, in, priests are divided by political views and worldviews. Um, but nothing of that sort came out as an open letter. And, and so I think it was a really, really interesting moment. Um, what was very interesting is that the letter came out of a group of priests that clearly identified with the legacy of Alexander Min, who was a liberal minded priest um, in, the in the perestroika period. He was murdered in 1991. And, and there are still few parishes that are sort of inspired by him. Also his son has become a priest and he's continued that legacy of a kind of liberal orthodoxy inside the Russian Orthodox Church. And, and this letter came out of that group. Actually, if those of you who read the letter, it starts with a quote by Alexander Min. It's very clear in a way what, what they want to say. It's, mm -hmm. um, and it's also clear in saying that, so Alexander Min was someone who was in, in, in opposition in a way to, to the Soviet government. And I think we should also be in opposition to a state, even though it's no longer Soviet, it's, it's uh, sort of the, the new Russian Federation. Will the, will the relationship stay? Uh, change? I don't think it will change much because the patriarch anyway knew that the priesthood is divided. Um, but I do think that what is happening um, kind of underneath is that this consensus on orthodoxy as being on the whole a good thing in Russian society is waning. So this pro-orthodox consensus, as it has been called by, by sociologists, is waning. And, and I think it, this will also show in, in, in priests uh, maybe stepping down from office or being more vocal about criticizing the patriarch. There's a Russian word for that. It's called means leaving the church. 
And as a, I mean, you know, these are always small phenomena, but if you, if you follow that on the internet, you find these debates, uh, these discussions, these stories, also books are now written about it, about this Rastiakovian sort of leaving the church again. Um, and and in the, I think we have to see that letter also in this general moment of, of critique. Um, it was, I, I mean, I was very impressed. I, I thought it was something, you know, one, one didn't expect and it was it was a strong sign of, of plurality inside inside the Russian Orthodox Church. Yeah, in the same uh, on the same line, there is a question on um, the, the the church response to the recent reset by the Parliament of the Russian Constitution to to pave the way for Putin to continue to stay in power. Do, do you have you heard of any official or unofficial statements about that from the church? Um, I have to admit that I haven't followed closely. I mean, um, the church will not be against Putin staying in power. The church has been doing extremely well. Um, it has gotten a lot from Putin um, that it would not have dreamt, could have dreamt of in any other situation. I mean, now you will get God in, in the institution, probably in the preamble. You you will get the definition of marriage between being between a, the, between a man and a woman. Um, so you you get a lot of the of, of the desired items, um, and in that sense, the patriarch cannot be anything but happy about about yeah. this. So that's why, if you allow, I'm going to show a slide that show exactly that the situation right now is that the state control the religion all the religion, and if you look at discrimination, you can make a difference between state and societal discrimination. And it's quite, quite strong to see that actually, if I may share my, uh, my screen, the state um, discrimination, uh, I'm not seeing it anymore. My, uh, so I will do without the slide because I'm not seeing it anymore. Um, the, the state discrimination against all religion is higher than the social discrimination in the sense that the, the um, control and repression of religious activities come mostly from the state, not the citizen. Except, I would say, what these data don't show is that the Russian Orthodox Church is not treated the same way than other religions, correct? Um, I mean, they have a, a breathing room, so to speak, or, or a greater leverage of acting and practicing than other religion, right? Yes, I mean, I think one also has to see that um, it, it depends on what, what data these are on, on state discrimination of religion. But if you look at, for example, religious freedom data, so infringements of religious freedom, there is a, the SOVA NGO um, that reports on that regularly. Um, you see that a lot of this um, discrimination is taking place on local and regional level. So uh, not on the state level, sort of on, in, in, on lower levels of the administration. And, and on the lower levels of administration frequently are still very much in a spirit also of, of the former Soviet Union. So they are not necessarily very open to religion in the first place, um, especially if, if they still remember some of their you know, Marxist indoctrination. I mean, that, that is bound to change, obviously, as the generations change. Um, but um, so deep, I don't know now where this data come from because you're right, I think on a state level, the Russian Orthodox Church has millions of privileges over other religious groups. Um, but I, I could really imagine that um, on a day-to-day -day level in local administrations, um, deciding on, I don't know, creating a parking lot for a church or for a religious prayer place or whatever, that you know, religious groups will feel discriminated on many levels, um, whether they're Orthodox or not. Um. We're going to move on the third block of discussion, which is the relationship or the position of, of orthodoxy in the Russian foreign policy. Uh, but also I would like to say the, the position of the Russian orthodoxy in the global orthodox world, because there are lots of things here 
and this that we, we need to uh, address, including the, the discussion of the break between the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the, uh, the Russian one, which brings us back to the question of the nationality and the, and the community. Yeah. So uh, maybe we should start with this position of orthodoxy in the global Orthodox world, because there have been tension and some question refer to it between this global yeah. Orthodoxy and Russia, who think that they, uh, Russian, who think that they have a privilege leading role in, in this world. So could you talk a little more about that? Yes, I mean, there are huge tensions. And, you know, the, I think the Russian Orthodox Church started um, with these big ambitions of becoming sort of the new spokesperson, sp leading church of the Orthodox Commonwealth. Um, mm -hmm. There is a, the Russian Orthodox Church published an encyclopedia. And number one of the encyclopedia has, has the voice on sort of how many Orthodox there are in the world. and. And then um, you have all these, you know, numbers and the Russian Orthodox Church, of course, has the, has the biggest number of believers and, um, and which really, you know, there are no baptism registers. I mean, they, they, I think they just took the number of, of population from Belarus and, and Ukraine at the time and, and, and Russia and they put it together and there was just, uh, almost 600 million or something. So the Russian Orthodox Church, so the leading Orthodox Church. And that, of course, hasn't happened at all. It hasn't, it hasn't worked. And, and I think this is, in a way, the biggest defeat also of, of Kirill, who was, after all, the leader of the External Relations Department of the Russian Orthodox Church for many, many years before becoming um, the, the, the patriarch. And, and so he was really the person in charge of relations with, other, with the other Orthodox churches. And in, in a situation like in 2016, when the, the Pan-Orthodox Council finally took place um, and Russia deserted the council because they couldn't agree on, on, on a way of voting or Russia didn't agree with the way of voting that had been proposed um, because it felt it didn't have um, the, the, the correct power in, in, in that moment. Um, I think it was a big sign of defeat in a way that, that the Russian Orthodox Church is really not that strong um, and, and it doesn't have sort of a, a weight and authority inside, inside this Orthodox Commonwealth. And here, of course, now we come to the question of Ukraine yes. um, because um, the, the, the split um, inside uh, Ukrainian Orthodoxy between um, a Russian Orthodox Church inside Ukraine or a Ukrainian Orthodox Church that uh, orients to Moscow and the Patriarchate of Moscow. And now this uh, new metropolis installed by, uh, by um, Patriarch Bartholomew giving autocephaly to a Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Um, I mean, that, that was a clear break in that moment. And there has been a break. I mean, the they, they, Russian Orthodox Church no longer commemorates the Patriarch. And, and there's no longer a communion between the churches. So for, that was a real break, but it, it was also a sign of weakness um, that that even happened. Um, I don't know if, if people remember, but in, in the weeks leading up to, to this declaration, um, Patriarch Kirill had spoken to Patriarch Bartholomew several times, and afterwards he got press releases, uh, which was sort of reassuring, saying, well, no, everything's all right, and, and, and the Patriarchs have understood each other. And then something came out which completely hadn't, yeah. you know, they hadn't prepared for that. It's really yeah. striking. So if we look at indeed this attempt, this claim to lead global orthodoxy from the Russian patriarchate and the fact that, as you mentioned, maybe this is not as a secure position as the patriarch would wish, then is there an attempt between the patriarch and the state, it's clear that Putin is using it for international role, but I'm, I'm inclined also to say that the patriarch is using Putin also <laughs> for, for also this leading international role. Would you, would you say this is where I'm thinking of the ongoing discussion on the status of uh, Christian minorities in, in the Middle East, for example, and uh, how struck I am by the role that the Orthodox churches have taken on, on, on that topic and, and how it feeds both very nicely the interest of Putin in the region and the interest of, of the church. So um, how can you say a few words on, on this use of the orthodoxy as a tool for putting foreign policy and um, also the connection with the interest of the, of the orthodox church. 
Yeah, no, so there's definitely the Russian Orthodox that uses, um, this Russian state uses orthodoxy uh, in its foreign policy. Um, I just give you another image, which was very striking, and some of you may remember, just a few weeks before the Creed Council, um, Putin visited Mount Athos. Um, and, and he was followed up by a whole TV uh, um, group, and, and it was all televised, and, and you see Putin taking part in a, in, in a mess and he's, he's, he's been stood up in, in a kind of throne um, in, in, in a special place of honor inside the church, really giving, conveying this image of Putin as a leader, as, as, the, as the, 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 the leader, a worldly leader of, of the Orthodox, of, of the world Orthodoxy. Um, so uh, I think Putin has very cleverly played with that and, and I do think that the Middle East plays an important role because after all, um, I think there, there are also um, Orthodox Christians in the West who felt, who feel that um, Christians in the Middle East have been um, sort of left alone by Western powers. And it's really been um, the Russian intervention uh, that, that has, um, um, at least this is how it has been conveyed, um, that has been won on the side of, 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 of these Christian groups. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, the Middle East was a moment where, where yes, it was a kind of win-win situation of publicity for both of them. Um, now you say, is, um, is the church, uh, I, I mean, my, op my view is that the, the state very cleverly uses of the church what it can need, what it wants to use for its foreign policy. Um, it, it can use themes, um, traditional values at the UN, a set of resolutions, traditional family and other work they did at the UN. In the Council of Europe, you see state, Russian state diplomats carrying forward a lot of themes that come right out of church discourse. The Russian Orthodox Church has an office, a representation in Strasbourg that follows debates at the Council of Europe and also follows debates in Geneva at the, at the UN. Um, so they are very well informed. Um, they have um, annual meetings. At, I mean, the annual meetings are public. Um, um, every year there is a, a coordination group between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the minutes are not public of these meetings, but there's a list of topics which are discussed. And so there is, a, there is a close coordination for sure. Um, and I think um, Russia has become a more forceful uh, player on conservative issues, on moral conservatism. Um, and this is clearly an agenda that, that it has um, been offered on a silver plate in the, by the Orthodox Church and it's just taken it. Yes, there, there is, to, to follow up on that, there is clearly an international agenda of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church that for me reminds me what I have seen with uh, some uh, international Islamic organizations about promoting traditional values and trying also to um, make sure that religious uh, beliefs and, and identities are respected internationally. And I think that the Russian Orthodox Church is playing a big role in there. You mentioned this privilege of particular position within the, the uh, um, you know, uh, European institution. So there is an attempt here to, it seems to me, as long as Putin will help, it's okay. But there is an agenda that is probably beyond the, the, the interest of the Russian state itself. Um, uh, and that's why the comparison with me, for me, is with, with some of the Islamic organization. I know that also promote this idea of we need a, a greater awareness of religious belief and, and uh, expression on the international scene. Uh, what would you say to that? You know, I'm, I'm not sure whether I 100% agree because the Russian Orthodox Church internally is very divided. And, and the opposition on the right to Patriarch Kirill and his kind of internationalist line is very strong. So there, there are a very uh, loud, sort of noisy Orthodox fundamentalist groups um, that are very ha unhappy about the Patriarch having such a visibility mm. and so many contacts with, with Western churches. Um, and on the occasion of, of the Patriarch meeting the Pope um, at the airport of Havana, 
um, there were groups formed and, and they were not so small they, and they were also quite visible, um, which called the Patriarch Heretic. Yeah. And which in, 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 in their services would st stop commemorating the Patriarch. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't doubt, doubt that Kirill has a big design on where he wants to lead the church. But I think that we have strong reasons to doubt that um, he will be able to do that. Because um, I, think, I think what we see now is a strong opposition from the right. Um, and and it, the church could, move, could become more conservative, even more conservative. But at that point, it will no longer be of use to the state because the Russian state uh, doesn't want an ultra conservative right. church. Yeah. But, but it doesn't. And then, it will, then it, will, it will sort of contract. But it doesn't mean that there would not uh, um, going on or keep going on an international agenda. That's the point. The international agenda may be um, uh, resisting, I would say, the, the interest of the, of the Russian state to a certain extent. Um, th that's what is, is clearly here. I think that th that's why I'm not sure the, the discourse that the state is instrumentalizing the Russian orthodoxy for me as its limit. In, if, you, if you look at the internal dynamic and the, the position of the Russian Orthodox Church vis-a-vis -vis global orthodoxy, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a more global religious issue uh, in general. So I think there is a, a quid pro quo uh, in there that is uh, more than the instrumentalization, you know, because that's unfortunately sometimes what we hear the most, that Putin is using the church. Let's, Oh. Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't, I would not, I would, I, I, I agree with you that uh, it, it's, it's too narrow to think that Putin is using the church. Um, but um, I think it, it, I also don't see it as realistic as the church being able to carry forward a strong international agenda without the state. So, I mean, at the moment, they have this moment of grace where, where the church and the state work unisono for, for their conservative policy goals, also on the international level. But, but without the state, um, who would the church turn to? I mean, if we think who was there before in the 1990s, so bef or in, even in the 2000s, in the Medvedev years, when the church didn't have all that support. I mean, they did look for close contacts with the Vatican. They got them. But then Pope Benedict stepped down and Pope Francis moved in and he's no longer so interested. And, and that connection kind of collapsed. Um, they have had connections with um, American Christian groups like the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, but these are smaller things. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, what we see now, this very forceful on an international level, Russian Orthodox Church um, is, is much related to the state. Okay, so I will try now to wrap up with a few of the questions that have um, not been really addressed. There, is a, there was a question on the potential within the ROC for democratic reform, not only within the church, but in, in the Russian society at large. Do you think that uh, there is a potential there um, toward greater democratization in Russia related to the dynamic of the ROC itself? You know, I definitely think there is a potential, you know, I mean, my early research was about um, religious dissident groups. I mentioned Alexander Main before in the late Soviet period, you know, I mean, I, I'm, a, I, I'm very much aware of, 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 of a pluralism inside the Russian Orthodox Church, but it has also pained me a lot to see that these groups um, have had a really, really hard time in the last years, you know, I mean, they do exist, definitely, um, but they've had, they have had a hard time and, and it's getting ever harder. So um, in that sense, uh, the, the question follows up on saying whether there is more chance for democratization coming out in the Ukrainian context, and I think that's definitely the case. Um, but this is also because um, in the Ukrainian situation, um, I think Ukrainian orthodoxy is very different from Russian orthodoxy. It's um, um, religious life in Ukraine has, uh, has continued more, uh, more throughout the Soviet Union, um, and, and there's more of a gra of religious grassroots in Ukraine than there are in Russia. Um, and I, I do think that in that situation, a political instrumentalization is, is harder um, in, in the Ukrainian context than it is in Russia. Yes, uh, I would like to um, 
close up with one question because we talked about the status of Islam in period in past in the past. What is now the relationship between the rock and um, Muslim groups uh, mm -hmm. in Russia? Well, you know, as long as it goes about um, traditional values, they are the good Muslims and relations are excellent. I mean, they, they agree on traditional values. Um, you know, Muslims support conservative family values and um, just as much as the Orthodox Church wants, wants supports them. Um, but as I said, they are, the, the, you know, Muslim, the, the Muftiyat of Kazan is, is, is good, you know, and, and other Muslim groups in, 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 in the Caucasus are good, but then, um, Muslim groups that f are considered not um, in in line with the official uh, requirements, they um, they are rejected. So the relationships are good on this on the official on yeah. on on that level. And I think this is also important because now to wrap up back to nationalism, because there are so an ethnic Russian nationalism is is very xenophobic vis-a-vis -vis Muslims. You know, like in in a city context like Russia. Um, Muslims from the Caucasus, people from the Caucasus from Central Asia face a lot of discrimination, um, like a, a lot of racism. Um, as a kind of as an ethnic group, they face a lot of racism. So there is there is a, a lot of nationalism. Whereas on the church level, you know, the, the, there there are, there is a di very different relationship, which which again I, I sort of proves the point that there are very different paradigms of nation. Um, belonging to a nation that I'd work in, in, in the Russian prison. Yeah, to, to wrap up on that, what was very interesting in the research I did is to see that when the term Islam is mentioned across, you know, public discussion in Europe, it's always associated negatively with issues of terrorism and security. While it was striking that that's not the case in Russia. There, there is a, a two parallel discussions. There is indeed this continuous reiteration that Islam is part of the Russian community. And, and indeed, you have, what I saw is that the patriarch has been a leading force in this, in this discussion. And there is, a, I would say, a demonization of external Islam, meaning the Islam that is broading terrorism, uh, in other parts of the world and that is threatening the Muslims of Russia. And what was fascinating yeah. to see the, the Russian, the Muslims of the Federation endorsing <laughs> to get more resources from the state. So this was quite unusual when uh, you, know, you know how the discussion of Islam is about the externalization, putting, him at, at putting it as an enemy internal and external, why in the Russian context, it's a little more complicated than that, where you see a distanciation. No, no, we, we have the good Muslims and they are threatened by, by uh, Muslims from outside and how it serves the interest of everybody, the Muslim groups, the church and the state that increase this level of control because, you know, we may have to deal with these bad Muslims from outside. So this was very interesting to me. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I responded to all the questions or that we addressed all of them. What we can do, especially because there were uh, questions or requests for references, we're going to try to respond to it um, uh, by uh, writing up. To, yes, to definitely. And, uh, so I would like here to thank all of you. Um, and thank you. This was a great. Thank you, Christine. We definitely have to get together <laughs> for real. Yes, you're right. in better circumstances. But thank you very much to, for talking to us. And um, stay tuned because we may have another session for Islam, probably. But I don't know in which context, national context, yet. Thank you very much. Be well, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.